Hello all, this is Dr. Fox. Let's talk about the stomach. In this video, we'll discuss the structure and features of the stomach as well as how it relates to other viscera within the abdomen. The stomach is an organ of the foregut. The foregut begins at the beginning of the abdominal esophagus and it ends at the major duodenal papilla of the second part of the duodenum. And as you can see, the stomach is the largest portion of the foregut. The stomach is preceded by the esophagus, boluses, so those are food mixed with saliva, traverse the esophagus and enter into the stomach for further digestion. They enter at the cardiac orifice and succeeding the stomach and the processes of digestion. Um, chyme, which is that transformed substance from the bolus, is ejected through the pyloric orifice, through the pyloric sphincter, into the duodenum. The stomach is a rather expansive organ, so as it is loaded with more boluses, it can accommodate that volume, and it can then contract back into its original size and, uh, and orientation. As it expands, folds of the lining called gastric rugi, rugi are ridges, um, largely go away, and as the stomach settles back into its original form, those rugi reform. There are curvatures to the stomach. Uh, there is a greater curvature. The greater curvature starts at this cardiac notch, and it extends left laterally all the way to the pyloric orifice. The greater curvature of the stomach is in association with the greater omentum. And there are three components of the greater omentum uh, that are going to connect the stomach to other aspects of the abdominal cavity. So there is a gastrophrenic ligament. That gastrophrenic ligament runs from the greater curvature of the stomach to the diaphragm. There is a gastrosplenic ligament, which connects the greater curvature of the stomach to the spleen. And then finally, a gastrocolic ligament, which connects the greater curvature of the stomach to the transverse colon. Oftentimes this is referred to as the omental apron. And it's called that because it hangs down anterior to the uh, the small intestines and to the uh, the transverse colon and it is richly imbued with adipose connective tissue. There is also a lesser curvature of the stomach. The lesser curvature of the stomach begins at the cardiac orifice, and it extends over to the pyloric orifice. And it consists of um, an attachment to the liver called the hepatogastric ligament, hepato liver gastric stomach, which is a part of the lesser omentum. So lesser curvature is associated with the lesser omentum. The other part of the lesser omentum, which will be discussed in another learning objective, is the hepato duodenal ligament, which is going to run from the porta pattis of the liver down to the duodenum. The stomach has three major parts. 
Uh, there is the body of the stomach. Uh, the body runs from a plane, a horizontal plane, that starts at the cardiac notch and extends to the greater curvature. And it runs down to another plane that begins at the angular incisure of the stomach. And then there is an oblique plane that runs over. So this area is the body. The region of the body, which is adjacent to the cardiac orifice, is called the cardiac region. I'll surround there. Superior to the body is the fundus. The fundus is everything that is above that plane from the cardiac notch to the greater curvature. And then there's also the pyloric part. The pyloric part begins at that plane from the angular incisure down to the greater curvature all the way out to the pyloric orifice. The pyloric part is generally divided into two segments. The, uh, the segment which is proximal is called the pyloric antrum or just antrum. And that runs from that angular incisor plane over to another plane. There is a very inconstant, uh, they call it the intermediate sulcus that can sometimes be seen uh, from the serosal surface of the stomach. And anything distal to that plane is called the pyloric canal, sometimes just called the pylorus. Oftentimes, the pylorus is referred to as the area that is um, inclusive of the pyloric sphincter. That would be the aggregation of sphincteric smooth muscle that's separating the pyloric part from the duodenum, as well as the pyloric orifice, which is the space or the, um, the lumen within that sphincter. The stomach is supplied by blood through a variety of sources, and the sources are derivatives of the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk is the dominant blood supply to the derivatives of the foregut, and there are three major branches to it, and we'll discuss the branches and uh, their components in a subsequent learning objective, but there is a left gastric artery. The left gastric artery supplies the lesser curvature of the stomach, as we can see there. There's also a right gastric artery. The right gastric artery is a branch of the common hepatic artery. So the common hepatic artery is what originates from the celiac trunk. And then it becomes the hepatic artery proper also known as HAP or HAP. And that right gastric artery is a branch of the hepatic artery proper that also serves the lesser curvature. And very frequently anastomoses, even openly anastomoses with the left gastric artery to serve that lesser curvature. The uh, common hepatic artery also has other branches which serve the uh, stomach. So if we follow that common hepatic artery along, we see that there is a gastroduodenal artery. That gastroduodenal artery is going to be the star of subsequent learning objectives uh, with respect to blood supply to the duodenum and uh, pancreas. And one of its branches is the right gastroomental artery, um, also known as the right gastroepiploic artery. So you may hear it referred to as either of these names. The right gastroomental artery serves the greater curvature of the stomach, 
as well as the greater omentum, or the omental apron. There is a counterpart to this, a left gastro-omental, or left gastroepiploic artery, which is a derivative of the splenic artery, as we can see here, which is a direct branch of the celiac trunk. That left gastro-omental artery, or gastroepiploic artery, is going to serve the greater curvature of the stomach and anastomose, often openly with the right gastro-omental artery. So the gastro-omental arteries are going to serve the greater curvature. The gastric arteries are going to serve the lesser curvatures. There are also um, short gastric branches of the splenic artery, which are going to serve the fundus of the stomach. So those are short gastric branches. So as you can see here, we have a variety of sources of blood to the stomach, and anastomoses are quite plentiful. With respect to the innervation of the stomach, or the autonomic innervation of the stomach, uh, there are two major sources here. There is the, uh, the celiac plexus. The celiac plexus um, originates at the celiac ganglia. So here we can see, oh, let me switch colors here so we can see them better. So here are those ganglia, and there's a little bit of plexus between them. Those celiac ganglia are where um, two of the three thoracic splanchnic nerves, so these are preganglionic sympathetic fibers that um, are coming from uh, the, uh, the thoracic um, spine, moving through the paravertebral ganglia without synapsing, and then moving down, um, traversing down through the, the crura of the diaphragm before finally synapsing in the celiac ganglia. So the greater and the lesser thoracic splanchnic nerves will, uh, will move through there. Also, the posterior vagal trunk will also have fibers that move through those ganglia, but will not synapse there. And so fibers of the thoracic splanchnic nerves and posterior vagal trunk will then form the celiac plexus. And the celiac plexus will be distributed to organs of the foregut through the celiac trunk and its branches. So these autonomic plexuses can deliver their fibers along the, uh, the blood vasculature conduits. Also serving the stomach will be fibers from the anterior vagal trunk, not shown here. These vagal trunks are going to enter the abdominal cavity along with the uh, esophagus. So they're going to be transmitted uh, through the esophageal hiatus at approximately the T10 level. Uh, anterior trunk will be anterior to the esophagus. Posterior trunk will be posterior to the esophagus. And as you can imagine, with the proximity of that abdominal esophagus to the stomach, these fibers aren't going to have a very long distance to go in order to find their targets within the walls of the stomach. Now, in terms of action, when we think about the divisions of the autonomic nervous system, there's the parasympathetic, which is the rest and most importantly here, digest, as well as the sympathetic, which is the fight or flight. And so parasympathetic stimulation is going to stimulate the smooth muscle of the walls of the gut tube. It will cause it to contract and enhance gastric motility. It will also relax the, uh, the sphincters, which are flanking the stomach, as well as encourage the gastric mucosa to secrete. Sympathetic stimulation will do just the opposite. Uh, it will be involved in vasoconstriction, but it will also 
inhibit smooth muscle contraction or inhibit motility, as well as tighten the sphincters that flank the stomach. General visceral afferent fibers, or GVA, accompany both sympathetics and parasympathetic fibers. In terms of the GVA fibers which accompany the sympathetic fibers, these are going to transmit um, visceral pain. So it's not true pain, but any sort of distension or tearing or, or burning will transmit um, information along these general visceral afferent fibers, um, which are going to mirror the distributions of the sympathetic fibers. And this referred pain is going to be felt in the epigastric region. So the epigastric region or the epigastrium, if you put your hand right at your, uh, your xiphoid process, that's kind of um, almost central within the epigastric region. That's where any um, referred pain from the stomach is, is going to be felt. So we've talked a bit about uh, the constituent parts of the stomach, uh, how the lesser and greater curvatures of the stomach relate to elements of the lesser and greater omenta. We've discussed blood flow to the stomach. We've discussed the autonomic innervation of the stomach. This is your summary slide. Thank you very much for your time.